Pokemon Red and Blue, two games that shaped the childhoods of millions of children across the globe. To some, just hearing those few words or opening notes has the power to send their brains into a heavy, bittersweet nostalgia, knowing that those simple times have been locked into the deepest parts of childhood's closet. But taking off those rose-tinted glasses, the cracks of the original Generation 1 games immediately reveal themselves. And one big problem is the assortment of mediocre Pokémon that haven't aged well in battle. Today, I'll be making improvements to a few of the most underwhelming Gen 1 Pokémon that still haven't received any good treatment and make them more usable in a playthrough in their respective games. With that being said, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe. It helps out the channel and lets me know that you want to see more of these Pokemon fixing videos. With that being said, let's take a look at Generation 1's most underwhelming Pokemon. To start off, we're going to be talking about one of the most infamous cases of terrible base stats, Onyx. This one's a bit of an exception since I know that Onyx did get a buff in the form of Steelix, but in every Kanto game, which there are a lot of, you're stuck with just Onyx. So I think it's fair game to make it better than the miserable mess it is right now. Also, Steelix is a trade evolution, so not everybody can get it. So let's make Onyx something worth keeping in its base form too. Looking at its gag-inducing stat distribution, we can see that there's one stat that is much higher than the rest, being its physical defense at an astonishing 160. Problem is, it fails at being a physical tank at all because there's an easy counter. Just use a special move. Rock Ground is a pretty bad typing, and it's made even worse for Onyx since it only has a base 45 special defense. And three of its five weaknesses are special, so it's getting one shot most of the time. This leads to its second problem. In Kanto, the first place you can catch an Onyx is in Rock Tunnel three badges into the game. By that point, you've already gotten access to much better rock or ground type Pokemon, and as such, Onyx ends up being a Pokemon that you have absolutely zero reason to use. So let's see how we can reasonably make it good. First off, the obvious fix. Improve Onyx's overall base stats. The first thing I do is to increase its HP to 60 for a little more bulk, since 35 is just awful. Secondly, and most obvious, increase its physical attack stat. I decided on 90, which seems strange given that it's higher than Steelix's, but it works well with the next change, which is to raise its speed. For a Pokemon that can rapidly bore through the ground, I think it should have a base 100 speed stat. This will allow it to get critical hits more frequently in Gen 1, as well as just let it get in a hit before fainting. I would also lower its defense all the way down to 100 since I'm making it more of a glass cannon. As for moves, in the Gen 3 games, giving it Earthquake and Explosion by level up would be nice. And in more recent games, Onyx could even get more attack coverage with the Elemental Fangs, Crunch, and Heavy Slam, as well as Coil to boost its attack and accuracy, which I think makes sense given that it's shaped like a snake. And I mean, there are like zero rock type moves with 100% accuracy. Lastly, for abilities, two that I think would work are Sandstream, since it pairs well with its rock typing, and No Guard, which seems a bit strange at first glance, but a few dex Entries state that Onyx has an internal magnet to never lose direction, so being able to always attack and never miss could give it a small niche over other rock types. These changes would actually give players a reason to use Onyx over Steelix, kind of like Scyther and Scizor. You could choose between being speedy at the cost of some defense or focus purely on defense while losing speed. When it comes to the Pokemon least used by anybody in a Kanto playthrough, there are a lot of strong contenders such as Ditto and Onyx, but I feel like those are infamous for being terrible. This next Pokemon is one that I have hardly ever seen anybody use due to it being both incredibly mediocre and not obtained until later on. I'm talking about Seeking, probably one of the most unimpressive Pokemon both battle-wise and design-wise. I mean, seriously, I wonder how many people's favorite Pokemon is actually Seeking. This thing is hilariously bad, especially when pit against the myriad of far superior water types. So let's try to make it somewhat stand out, because right now this fish is just going to be stuck in its tank. Firstly, besides a decent attack stat, it has nothing else going for it. I'm honestly a bit stuck as to what I'd even do, given that it's literally just a goldfish, but I guess based on its dex entries and physical appearance, I'd raise its attack to 110, its defense to 80, and its special defense to 90. I don't really think making it faster would really fit it, seeing as it's a pretty chunky looking goldfish, so I think extra bulk would be nice. 
Now for its level of moves, in the Gen 3 games, I'd give it Water Pulse as an early level of move since Golding doesn't get any stab until Waterfall, which I find to be weird. For coverage moves, I'd give it Revenge since Seeking tend to be feisty, Stockpile, Swallow, and Spit Up to reference its behavior during mating season, Drill Peck since it already learns Peck, and it would be an easy way to counter grass types, and you know what? Why not Dragon Dance for some flavor? In more recent games, it could also get Liquidation, Close Combat, Iron Head, Drill Run, and and as a more controversial pick, Wild Charge. I actually think an electric move sort of fits given that it has Lightning Rod as an ability, so you could probably make the argument that Seeking can store the electricity for an all-out attack. And of course, as a final change, in the Kanto games, I'd probably make Golding available a lot earlier, since you can't get this thing until after you've completed the Pokemon Tower quest, which makes no sense given how underwhelming it is. The deck states that Seeking are aggressive fighters and strong swimmers, and I think these changes can allow Seeking to demonstrate that, unlike the puny, forgotten fish that we have right now. It's time to talk about Seviper's older cousin, Arbok, who is, well, underwhelming in pretty much every aspect. Just like Seeking, every single stat is mediocre besides its attack, which is still just decent. It suffers due to not being fast, not hitting hard, and not being tanky. It's just kind of there. What Arbok needs is something to make it stand out against the many Kanto poison types. So believe it or not, I'm actually not going to make it any faster like I did with Seviper. I think a lot of its level of moves make it more fitting as a bulkier physical attacker rather than the fast sweeper that I made Seviper. Obviously, with its current stats, it can't do that. So I'd raise both of its defensive stats to around 95, its HP to 70, and I would lower its speed to 60. It's not a complete monster, but given that Ekans evolves at just level 22, I think it's good enough. Speaking of it being a monster, let's give it some more creepy changes. Its Dex entries state that it uses the frightening pattern on its belly to intimidate and stun foes, so I don't see why Arbok didn't get an extra dark typing in Gen 2. It has enough evil attributes, and it would also give it a really unique niche of being a dark type in Kanto, allowing it to destroy the many rampant psychic types. As for level of moves, in the Gen 3 remix, I think it'll still have a hard time with coverage due to its low special attack, but some moves I'd give it are Poison Tail and Fang for better mid-game moves than Acid, and then Sludge Bomb later. Curse to boost its stats and to make it bulkier, Pursuit since the deck states that it never gives up hunting prey, and Revenge to complement it being slow and bulky. In the newer games, it could get Sucker Punch to showcase a snake's fast striking behavior, and Aqua Tail for ground type coverage. With these changes, Arbok could actually be the intimidating, powerful threat the deck makes it out to be, rather than the underwhelming sideliner it is. I gotta admit, I really love Hypno's design. It's so simple, yet subtly ominous, especially when paired with its dex entries. But sadly, Game Freak didn't pour as much love into its usability in battle. It's sort of in the same position as Arbok and Seeking, where most of its stats are mediocre and nothing else. Its special defense is great, but that's really it. It's unfortunate, since I think Hypno had a lot of potential to be unique, especially as a psychic type. My first change is pretty obvious. Give it an extra dark typing. The Gen 1 dex has zero dark types, excluding regional forms, so just like Arbok, not only is it fitting due to its sinister nature, but it gives Hypno a nice niche of being a psychic type that can beat its peers. As for its stats, I'd lower its speed to 50, increase its special attack by 10, and increase its physical defense by 20. It still won't hit super hard, but I think being bulkier leans into its slow, creepy behavior. As for level of moves, there are quite a lot of missed opportunities here. In the Gen 3 games, for psychic moves, it could get extra sensory and dream eater to play into its ability to use hypnotic powers. Call Mind for general boosting, then Pursuit, Faint Attack, Will-O-Wisp, and Curse for more evil attacks. However, in the newer games, it could get Drain Punch for coverage and healing, Stored Power if you want to set up, Payback as a better dark move, Hex if you want to rely on putting the enemy to sleep, and if you really want to play into Hypno's manipulative traits, Power Swap, Power Trick, and Gravity, which I think will play well with the ability changes I'm going to give it, being Shadow Tag and Prankster. Shadow Tag is pretty obvious, as Hypno could probably hypnotize the opponent into not being able to flee, and Prankster is so that it can use status moves first. I think these changes immensely help Hypno by not only bringing out its sinister reputation, but also making it interesting to use in battle. When it comes to the worst bug type Pokemon to ever exist, most would probably say something like Krikatoon, Wormadam, or Ladian. 
But I think a lot of people forget just how unforgivably bad Parasect is. And just like Ledian, it really sucks because Parasect's concept is really cool, a bug that was overtaken by its mushroom. Unfortunately, despite its cool lore, it's completely useless in battle. And I can say that from using it several times in Kanto Challenge playthroughs. It's slow, can't hit hard, and ironically, dies easily. So this thing is going to need a huge makeover. Firstly, it's typing. Bug Grass is just awful. In fact, in the original Generation 1 games, it holds the trophy for having the most 4 times weaknesses of any Pokemon ever, with 3, since Poison was also super effective against Bug. Seeing how Parasect is a zombified Bug Shell, it's a no-brainer to give it a part Ghost-type. I've seen this change proposed a lot around the internet, and not only does it make biological sense, but it also adds another Ghost-type in Kanto which it seriously needs. But now we have to choose whether we want it to be a Bug Ghost-type or a Grass Ghost-type. On one hand, and there are other mushroom Pokemon with the grass type. On the other hand, while the mushroom does all of the thinking, its Ultra Sun dex entry states that the bug is mostly dead, not completely dead. And if Shedinja, a lifeless husk, is still considered a bug, I think Parasite could still be considered a bug type as well. Now for its stats, I have no problem with it being slow. It's a zombified cicada, but I think its attack could be raised to around 120 and its physical defense raised to 100. For new level up moves, Parasite luckily gets some nice treats. In the Gen 3 games, it could get Fury Cutter and Shadow Ball as its best stab moves, and to play into its undead design more, it could also get Nightmare, Leech Seed, and Dream Eater, which will synergize well with Spore, and for some coverage, it could get Metal Claw in the early game and Revenge to complement its low speed. In newer games, along with its current moves, it could get Drain Punch as a reference to it sucking the life out of plants, Payback, Infestation, and as a controversial pick, I'd even give it the three order moves exclusive to Vespiquen. Parasite's whole design is based around its body being taken over by the mushroom on its back, so I think that the mushroom being able to command the body like a vehicle or machine could work. The only problem I see with it is that the move animation for the order attacks shows bees, so maybe it could be reworked, or there could be custom parasite themed moves. Either way, Parasect will finally be able to spread its legs instead of being sent in, and then knocked out the very next turn, never to be looked at again. But finally, we have one of the most forgotten yet most overshadowed Pokemon in existence, especially for Gen 1, Dugong. I mean, just look at it. It's just a white seal with a small horn. And to make matters worse, you can't find one until towards the very end of the game in the Seafoam Islands. And even once you catch it, these are the stats you're rewarded with. But to put the final nail in the coffin, you genuinely have zero reason to use it because it's been outclassed by several other Pokemon since day one. Want a hard hitter? Use Cloyster. Want a bulky water type? Use Lapras, who by the way is also obtainable earlier. Well, it at least has thick fat, right? Uh, yeah, Game Freak also gave that to another water ice type, Walrein, who is just far better in every way and is also a pinniped. It's almost like it was a direct replacement for Dugong. Much like how Mad Cargo in my previous video seemed unfixable, Dugong also seems to be in a similar boat. In fact, I'd argue that it's in an even worse situation because of how many water types there are. I don't think there's anything you could do to Dugong itself besides an evolution or something really drastic, but here are some changes that I think will help it make it slightly more desired. Firstly, Dugong needs some more bulk. Based on it having thick fat and hydration as its two abilities, it's clearly meant to be defensive. So I'd give it 10 more HP, 10 more special defense, 10 more defense, and 20 more physical attack. Yeah, it's a pretty big buff, but what it currently has needs some dire changes. Speaking of which, its next big problem, lack of move coverage. Even in newer games, it's incredibly limited with what types it can cover. Most of that is probably due to its bland design, but I still feel like there are some level of moves it can get that make sense. Firstly, in the Gen 3 games, it can get Mega Horn instead of Signal Beam to showcase its horn being used in battle. For some coverage, it could get Crunch since it has sharp tusks, and I don't think Earthquake would be too much of a stretch since it's a pretty hefty looking Pokemon. And to further display its blubbery body and habit of resting a lot, it could also get Belly Drum for extra power and then slack off in Pain Split as means of recovery. In newer games, it can even get more coverage based on its design like Zen Headbutt, Drill Run, Horn Leech, and Body Press. 
Lastly, while I think Thick Fat is a great ability, I think giving it a custom ability to showcase its fondness of ice and swimming would really give it something unique. The deck states that it becomes more energetic in colder weather, and it's water ice, so Dugong could get a new ability, which I'll call Frigid Frenzy, where its speed and attack are raised by 50% during rain or hail, but it also loses some of its HP every turn, as a result of it becoming hyperactive. But honestly, I don't think Dugong is unique enough to warrant an entire signature ability for it. And that leads to the unfortunate realization, as much as we want to fix these underwhelming Pokemon, at the end of the day, these are just wishful changes, unheard screams, and with these games being over 25 years old, I have a feeling that these old, forgotten, mediocre Pokemon will only continue to be buried within the ever-growing Pokemon bin, and as time passes, their names will slowly vanish into the depths, forever left starving for just a drop of recognition, suffocated by the waves of newer, flashier replacements. But I guess that's just how life is sometimes.